Again, welcome to Python programming language. In this lecture, we're going to dis discuss about input processing and output. That's the basic concept of programming. So our main objective is to go through how to again input a data using Python programming, processing, and also the output. Our process here will be only arithmetic operation for now. So again, our main objective, um, we shall go try to design a program, input, processing, and output. So to output a message, we normally use the print function. So we're going to learn how to display output to the print function. Also comment, variables. A variable is normally a memory location. So if we have a data and we want to store our data, we need to have a variable. We are going to again create a variable. Also, we're going to learn how to read input from the keyboard and also perform calculations. Uh, our calculations, again, will be our process here, which is arithmetic operations. So first, design a program. Here, we say that anytime we want to, again, develop a program or imp implement a program, uh, we don't just start writing the code straightforward. I think the first thing we should do is to come up with the design, the planning, Etc. What is our input? What should be the output? And the designing process is converting the input to an output. And normally we use the term algorithm. So we're going to be, uh, design the algorithms using, in this course, we're going to learn only two, two, uh, two tools, which is again using the pseudocode and also data flow diagram. So here we say program development cycle normally start with designing the program first. After we design the program, then we are going to write the code. That's to implement the code. After we implement the code, we are going to test it. That's uh, run it. Uh, if there's any error, then normally we have two types of error. Either syntax error. Syntax errors normally occurs during the compiling time. And what syntax error means is the grammatical error. Let's say, Python said we should end a statement with period, but we forget to do that, like English language. So normally the compiler would de detect that errors for us. Also, we can have what we call the logic errors. Uh, normally these errors, uh, we have to, again, uh, determine it, if to find it, or we sometimes use the term semantic uh, error. So testing the program, if there's no error, then we have done, uh, we complete our mission. So again, the steps is first, we need to design the program. In this lectures, we're going to learn only using two tools. That is the, again, pseudocode and data flow diagram to design the program. And if, if we take any advanced course in uh, software engineering, again, there are so many techniques we can use. So here we say designing is the most important part of the program development circle. The reason is very simple. If I design a program and I made a mistake or there's an error, well, we are going to carry this error to the end of the, uh, the project unless we identify it earlier. So normally we always say that in the design phase, if we can identify an error, it's less costly, less time. But if we implement the coding, everything, and testing, and we identify the error, this means we have to start all over. So again, designing is the most important part of programming development cycle. Now, to understand the task that the program is to perform. So as we mentioned earlier, designing process, we should know what is our input, and we should also know what to be, again, our output. Uh, if we know these two, we can come up with a design and we can convert the input to an output. So we need to determine the steps that must be taken to perform the task. This will be our creating algorithm. So algorithm is the listing of possible logical steps in sequential order. So first thing must be done first in order to accomplish a specific task. So our definition here said, a set of well-defined logical steps that must be taken to perform a task. And one thing these steps must be, must be in order. First task must be performed first, etc. 
So as we mentioned, there are two tools we are going to use there to design the program. The first is the pseudocode. Pseudo, pseudocode also called a fake code. Normally this would be in, in any language uh, the developer is comfortable with. For example, in our class, we are using English language most of the time. So I can use English language to write, to design your algorithm step by step what the program is going to do. For example, I want to write a program to find a sum of two numbers. So first I may write, if we are going to ask the user for the two values, then we can start with, let's declare two variables, allow the user to enter the two values. Then we need to perform the operation. Then we need to display our result. Everything will be in an order. So we are not going to display a result first before we ask the user to enter an input. So everything has to be in order. And normally we say the pseudocode is not meant to be compiled or executed, but because again, this is a normal language such as English, et cetera, but it's used to create a model program. So there's no need to worry about the syntax error. We can focus on that later on when we are writing the coding also can be translated directly into actual code in any programming language. So the next two, we are going to use the flowchart. So flowchart is a diagram that graphically shows the steps in a program. So we have some symbols, for example, the ovals are the terminal symbols. We also have a parallelograms. Uh, parallelograms are normally either the input or the output symbols. Then we have the rectangles, which will be the processing symbols. So the symbols, again, are connected by arrows that represent the flow of the program. So normally we know execution takes place from up down. So most of the time our arrow goes down. Now, sometimes we may have a loop or decision statement. Then again, the arrow can go up or go circle around uh, more or less a loop. So this is an example. Let's say we want to write a program that to calculate the gross salary of an employee. So we have the over to start. So we need an input. So first we say input the hours work. Then secondly, we are going to input the hourly rate. So if we know the hourly pay rate and hours work, we can calculate the gross pay, which is hours work, multiply by pay rate. So after we finish, we are going to display our results. So we can see the parallelogram is where we get our inputs and also the output to display the result. And the rectangle always will be the processing. Here our process is to calculate the gross pay. Then we also have to end it with over, always we start and end with over. Now we don't have a decision here. If we have a decision, like it will be a diamond symbol. And the future lectures again, we will see it. So typically again, computer perform three-step process. As we said, computer need an input, a data. Then with data, it can perform the operations, whatever operations we want to perform. Here again, we are going to focus on mathematical operations. Then after we get our result, we are going to again display the result. So it's input, processing, and output. Next, we should know what is a function. So a function is again a piece of pre-written code that perform an operation. So for example, I can write a function to find the sum of two numbers, or I may write a function to find the product of three numbers of values. So a function, again, perform a specific task. It's a piece of code. It can be only one line or as many lines as possible. So example given here is a print function. Print function display output on the screen. This function is given to us. So it's a pre-written code, the library file. So if I want to print, uh, I'm using Python, I want to print something on the screen, I don't have to write a function that to print. Uh, I can just use the print function. Every function have what we call the argument. So argument is the data that is given to a function. 
and normally will be the data the function is going to use to perform its tax. So for example, if you are write a function to find the sum of two numbers, the argument can be the two values, either it's a whole number or a decimal number. And the statement in the program is execute in the order that they appear. So normally, as we said earlier, from top to bottom, the you know, statement is a queue from top to bottom. Unless we have a decision to make, then maybe we have to branch to left or right, or looping, we go circle around to the loop terminate. So this is an example of a, a function. We can see this function will display uh, address of Kate Hostel. So we have a first print statement. We can see that the name is in a single quote. Again, it can be in a single quote or double quote. Uh, what is this that we call this the string? The string always is in another single or double quotation. And so here we are going to print Kate Austin. And one, two, three, full circle drive. Hashville, North Carolina, and the zip code 28899. So the same thing we have in the second, this time we have a different address, one, two, three, Dharma Lane. And here also we said this program displays a person's name and address. So the pound sign here is what we call the comment. So everything after the pound sign in one line will be ignored by the compiler. So that's like normally, we have a comment in a program to again explain what the program is doing, or we may have the name of the author of the program, the developer, uh, date, etc. For example, we are taking this course, uh, maybe an assignment, I may have a comment, my name, the assignment uh, name, and also the date, everything will be in the, again, a comment, use a pound sign. Now, our program here, what we are doing again is displaying Kate Austin, one, two, three, full circle drive, Asheville, North Carolina, 28899. So next we go to what is a string. As we said earlier, a string normally is in double or single quotation. So a string is basically a sequence of characters that is used as a data. Now, a string can be a characters like letters, A, B, C, D. Also, it can be values, a digit, one, two, three, et cetera. Or it can be a special, again, a symbol. It's, let's say a question mark or something. The, what will make it a string, it must be either in a single or double quotation, open and close. So that's example here. So here we see a string literal can be enclosed in a triple quotes also. And enclosed a string can contain both single and double quotes and can have multiple lines. So what is a comment? As we said earlier, comment is always ignored by the compiler. And the reason why we have a comment in our program, again, maybe to explain what the code is doing or what the program is doing in general or the name of the author, uh, the developer of the program. Uh, so we also have an end line comment, uh, which is the pound sign, so appears at the end of the line of the code. Also variables are very important. Variables, I need variables to store data. We always need variables. So variable, it means a memory location. Normally when we, declare a variable, we create a variable, the operating system will again randomly allocate the memory space in the computer chip, the memory. So again, variable is the name that represents a value stored in a computer memory. And normally it's used to access and also manipulate data stored in memory. And also a variable references the value it represents. So example given here, the synthesis always to the left will be the variable name, to the right will be the expression. It can be, uh, depends the type of 
data we are storing in the variable. If it's a strings or a value or arithmetic operation, formula, etc. So a very simple example given to a, we again create a variable, a variable name H and we assign 29, which means 29 is inside the variable H. So if I want to print the content of H, it will print 29. So the equal sign here in mathematics, this means equal sign. In computer programming, this means an assignment. So what we are saying here is that we are saying we assign 29 to a variable name H. Now, if I want to check if H equal to 29, then I'll use two equal sign. Uh, we will come to that when we start the selection statements or decision making statements. So again, in, in assignment statement, variable receiving value must be on the left side. Then a variable can be passed as an argument to a function. Also variable name should not be enclosed in the quotes marks. If, you, if we do that, then the variable name becomes a string. So let's say we have a variable name age and then we assign 29 to it. If I want to print, I will just have age in the print argument. Now, if I have age and I put it in a single quotation or double quotation, it's going to print age. But if I have age without single or double quotation, just the print age, then it's going to print the content of what. Now, if we didn't use a variable age, then it's going to give us an error. So we must have the variable, we must have the content, et cetera. So what are the rules for naming, again, variables in Python? First, we say that variable name cannot be a Python keyword. A Python keyword means any word that Python use or represent a, 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 a very significant meaning to Python. For example, print. Print function is a built-in function in Python. Uh, as far as all the cases are lowercase print, we cannot use it as a variable name or any identifier name. And what will happen is that if we do that, when we compile the program, we are going to get a sentence error. But now if we have print and I start the print with uppercase P or in the print, let's say the T last word T is uppercase, then again, it's not the same as the print function, everything lowercase. So again, Python is case sensitive. Lowercase and uppercase are not the same. So also, for example, when we start the looping, we have four, F-O-R, everything lowercase. We cannot use it as a variable name because Python understand I a, a loop. Okay. So variable name cannot be a Python keyword. Also, variable name cannot contain spaces. So if you want to use a space, maybe better to use underscores. That is the lower dash. Also, the first character cannot be a digit. So the first character can be either a letter or underscore. Now, after the first character, we can have digit, letters, and underscore. And as we mentioned earlier, variable names are case sensitive. So print function, everything lowercase is a keyword. But print function, all of them uppercase, or at least one of them is uppercase letter print. It's not, it's a, it's not a keyword because lowercase and uppercase are different. So we next, we go through what is a print function as we said earlier. Again, here we say pattern allows one to display multiple items with a single call to print. So again, this is a, a built-in function for us. We can see the print everything is lowercase, all the cases are lowercase. So items are separated by commas when passed as argument or argument display in the order they are passed to the function. So if I want to print something, if I want to print A first, then A should come first before B and C because they are print in order. So let's see an example here. So this is a very short program. We can write this code. Everything is correct here. What we have here is that we create two variables. One is top speed. You can see we can't have a space. 
So we are using underscore. So this is perfect. And also it doesn't start with a digit, it's T. So here we are assigning 160 to a variable name top speed. Also here we are assigning 300 to a variable name distance. Now next we want to display the values referenced by the variables. So you can see first we have a string, we say the top speed is, that's what we print on our screen because it's in single quote. But next we say top speed. And here we can see there's no double quotation or single quote sign, nothing. So this means we are going to print the content of top speed. So here our output for the first two prints will be the top speed is 160. Then the third one is a single code. So the distance travel is, then we can see the variable distance is not in a single or double code. So it will print the content of distance, which will be 300. So the output for this program will be the top speed is 160 and the distance travel is 300. So our main objective here is to learn how to assign values to a variable and also how we can display the content on our monitor using the print function. So variable reassignment, we can always again reassign, either change the value or we can even dereference it. So here we say variables can reference different values while program is running. Now we should know there's something we call the garbage collection. Now, Garbage collection is the process of removal of values that are no longer referenced by variables. So if a variable's uh, a value is not referenced by variable, let's say the variable is not being used no more, uh, Python interpreter will automatically call the garbage collection to remove it. Now in C++, we have a special function named delete or keyword delete. Java is the same as Python. Java also have a garbage collection which automatically delete the content if the variable is still referenced. So here we say variable can refer to item of any type. So variable that has been assigned to one type can be reassigned to another type. What we mean by type is the data type. For example, we have a decimal values, we have a whole number. We may discuss about that later on. So this is example here. This program demonstrates variable reassignment. We are going to assign a value to the dollars variable. So we have a, a variable named dollars. We assign 2.75, which means the variable dollars holds a decimal value, or sometimes we use the term double of fruit. Next, we print the string, the string I have, but you can see I have is in single quote. Then we have a comma. You can see dollars is not in a single quote. In my account, in my account is a string single quote. So what we're going to print here is I have 2.75 or $2.75 in my account. Dollars again is not, if now we put the dollars in a single or double quotation, then we are going to print the word dollars, not the content of the dollars. Now look what we did next. We reassigned, change the value from 2.75 to 99.95. Yes, we can do that. So this time I will output to be, by now I have $99.95 in my account. So again, we can reassign any value to a variable. So next we're going to talk about the numeric data types that is a, uh, values, numbers, and also what is a literals, and also what is a string data type. So STR stands for the string data type, which we saw earlier. Always what will differentiate a string from a numeric data type is that a string always is in either double quotation or single quote. So first we say, what is data types? We, in Python or most programming language, we are going to categorize values in memory. Uh, so, for example, we may have int for the integer. Int means it's a whole number, a whole number. This example can be 50, 100. Then float for real numbers. So float is a decimal values. Uh, how many decimal value depends. But 
Then we have STR again, STR is for string. So STR is used for storing strings in memory. Uh, the good news here is that it's not like Java. Like Java, when we declare variable, we have to include the data type. So for example, int age equal to 29. In Python, I would just say age equal to 29. Automatically, we know age is int, Python knows that. So a numeric in, in, in literal again is numbers written in a program. No decimal point considered in int, otherwise considered in float. So float is a decimal value, int is a whole number. Some operation behave differently depending on data type. So the three main categories, string, integer, and float or int and float. So reassign a value to a different type is possible also. So here we say variable in Python can refer to items of any type. So you can see here we have X is 99, which means a whole number. The variable S references a string now. We convert it to take me to your leader, which would be a string. So if a variable in Python can refer to items of any type. Now, next, we are going to learn how we can get an input from a keyboard. Now, when we declare variable, let's say age, and we assign 29, that value will remain the same anytime we run the program. Now, if, for example, we want to write a program whereby after we run it, we want the user to enter the age, that means it can enter any age we want, not only 29, then we have to find a way to get the input from the keyboard. So Python gives us a function name input, and that makes it possible for us to read an input from a keyboard. So this is the syntax here. Now, now this time, uh, for example, the print, we want to display the result. So what we want to display is in the argument of the print function. This time we are getting an input from a user. So if the user get a, uh, give us an input, this input must be stored somewhere. So always using the input method or function, we have to assign it to a variable because when the user enter the input, we are going to store it in the variable. So the syntax is the variable assignment to operator input the prompt. The prompt here will be an instruction. So for example, in the prompt here, we can say enter your age as a string, enter your age. So the prompt also instruction must be a string, otherwise we get an error. So here we say prompt is typically a string instructing user to enter a value. Does not automatically display a space after the prompt. So reading numbers with the input function. Here we say the input function always return a string. That's the only thing we should know. So if for example, I want to do arithmetic operations and I tell the user to enter two values, let's say 20 and 50, using the input function. If I use 20 and 50 with the plus sign, it's going to join the answer together. So it will be 20, 50. If I use manuals, I'll get error because again, anytime we get an input from a keyboard using the input function, the data already is strained. So Python did a good job for us. They gave us an int function and also float function, which can convert the possible two values we can have. is either a whole number or a decimal number for now. And later on, we're going to study some few more things. So which means if I get the input finish, I'm going to call or I'm going to use the int function with the variable. The, the argument here can be the variable. Let's say we have age assign input and the argument say enter age. When the user enter the age, age will go to the variable name age. Then I'm going to say int age, the argument here will be age because I want to use the age to do some arithmetic operations. Now, if I want to display the age, then I don't need to change it to a numeric type, either int or float. And again, we're going to do lab work and we shall go through this. So we have something called a nested function call. This is very good 
we can do this once for the input. So for example, I have the input and the instruction as argument. Then I have the int. Then the int argument will be everything for the input and instruction. So here we have a nested function call. Uh, the int function argument is also the input function. And the input function also have its argument. And so that's the syntax here. We have function two with its argument. Function two and its argument is an argument for function one. So it's again called a nested function call. So let's see the first example here. So this is a real code. We have a comment that we want to get the user's first name. So you can see we have the input function, the instruction say enter your first name. It's in single quotation, we close it here. So when the user enter the first name, it will go to a variable name first name. Now get the user's last name. We use the input function, enter your last name. So this will be the instruction. Then the user will enter the last name and we are going to store it in a variable name, last name. The next we want to print a greeting to the user. So we have the print function, the argument, hello. So you can see hello is what a string. So it's in a single quote, a string. But we want to print the content of the two variables. So we have first name, comma space, last name which means we're going to print the content of first name and the last name. Let's say the first name is Charles, the last name is William. So it will be hello, Charles, and with, with space and William. So next example, get the user's name, age, and income. So we use the input function, what is your name? Now, name is always a string, so we don't need to convert it. As, as we said, the input, function always give us an input and the data type of input of this string. But now we need the age and we want the age to be in number. So you can see we use the nested function call here. We have the input, what is your name? That'll be the instruction. When the user enter the, I'm uh, sorry, input, what is your age? When the user enter the age, we are going to convert it to int. So you can see we have the int function outside the input function. And this is the concept of, again, nested function call. So the content of the age will be the age and the data type of the age will be int. Same thing with the income. So we call we use the input function. What is your income? User enter the income. Then we convert the income to float. Then we assign it to a variable name income. Now we can display our data. So here is the data you entered. Again, this is single quote. So we have name with a column, single quote. Then we print the content of the name variable. So this will be the actual name we enter. Same thing, we have the age in the single quote. Then we print the content of age. Then we have income with column, single quote. So that's a string. So we're going to say a string name, age, income, followed by the content of name, age, and income that we enter. Now, next, we're going to learn how to perform calculations. So, so far, we know input, we know output, input about the variable, either we assign value to a variable or we use the input function. We say the output also, we can use the print function. Now, the last thing we need to learn is the mathematical operations. So, we can perform a calculations or mathematical operations in Python. So Python have what we call the math operator, and this will be the tool for performing calculations. Then the operands will be the values or can be the variable. So if I say two plus three, plus is an operator, a mathematics operator, the operand will be the two and the three, the values. So here we say the math operator, the tool for performing calculation, add up plus addition, multiplication, division, then the operands will be values surrounding the operator. Sometimes it can be variables, but the variables must have the content of the values. So next is resting value, uh, sorry, resulting value typically assigned to variable. 
So now let's start with the operator. So first we start with the division. In Python, we have two types of division. Division with only one forward slash will give, a, will give us a result of a decimal value of floating. So anytime, for example, 10 divided by three, if I use only one forward slash, it's going to give me 3.33 with the decimal values. Now, if I use double forward slash, it's going to give me only three. So anytime you are doing your operation and you want a floating result or decimal result, then use a single forward slash. Operator perform floating point division. Now, if you want your answer to be only a whole number, you don't need a decimal part, then use the double from the front slash. So we say here the positive results truncated, the negative rounded away from zero. So Python operator precedency is almost the same as arithmetic operation, uh, the order of operations. So for example, operations that have parentheses must be executed first. So operators in the parentheses execute first, same as a basic algebra or arithmetic. Then next, exponentials execute next, same as arithmetic operations. Uh, so in, in Python, Exponential can be double asterisk. So if I write two double asterisk three, it means two to the power three. So exponential is double asterisk. Multiplication is a single asterisk. So this is multiplication. Then as we said, division is two. We have forward slash, and that's for our floating div division. If I need a decimal result, I will use only one forward slash. If I need a whole number result, I will use double forward slash. Then if I need a remainder, I will use percent. So for example, seven percent two, the answer will be one because seven divided by two, the answer is what? Three remainder one. So a percent is called the remainder operator to give you the remainder. When you divide two values, the remainder of it to give to us. Then we have addition and subtraction. And these are the order of operations. So first again, parenthesis, then next is exponential, then multiplication division, then remainder, they are all on the same level. Then the last level is addition and subtraction. Same as arithmetic, basic arithmetic uh, college algebra. And here we say the higher precedence perform first. So parenthesis of course perform first and first exponential, et cetera. So even if I have two plus three in a parenthesis times five, because parenthesis, the plus is inside the parenthesis, it's going to perform first. That's why plus perform last. Normally multiplication first, but if it's in parenthesis, then it's going to perform first. So let's see an example here. As we said, X double asterisk Y means S to the power y. Remainder is percent. So if we say 4 percent 2, it means 4 divided by 2, the answer is still remainder 0. So our answer will be 0. But 5 percent 2 means 5 divided by 2, the answer is 2, the remainder is 1. So 5 percent 2, the answer will be 1. Because if we divide 5 by 2, the remainder will be 1. If we divide 4 by 2, the remainder is 0. We can also convert mathematics formula to a programming statement. So again, here we say operators require for any mathematical operations, any mathematical operation require operator. Now, when uh, what we mean by this is that, for example, in college algebra, I can write x y. X y means s times y. But in Python, I can't write s y. Let's say we have a variable s and y. I can't write S, so I have to write S times Y. So print always required if I want to do any mathematical operations. Now, when converting math mathematical operations or expressions to programming statement, we may need to add multiplication operators, and we may need to set parentheses, et cetera. And we shall see an example. So here we have a program, and here we say we have a comment here saying that 
this program gets an item original price and calculate its sales price with 20% discount. So which means if a user enter hundred dollars, the sales price will be and then 100 times 20, the result minus the original price. So 100 will give us $80. Or we can go ahead and say 100 times 0.8, since we know 20% is 0.2. So first thing we need to do is to tell the user to give, give us the original price. So we are using input function and tell the user enter the items original price. Now, since we are going to do arithmetic operation on this price, we need to convert it to either int or float. It depends what we want. We want our result in float, so we convert it to a float. We assign the result to a variable name original price. Now to calculate the amount of the discount, the discounts were 20%, which is 0.2. So we multiply the original price times 0.2, and we assign that to a new variable name discount. Now to calculate the sales price, then it will be original price that we enter minus the discount, and that will give us the sale price. The program said we should display the sales price. So we use the print function, the sell price is whatever the price is, the content. Sometimes also we can have what we call the mixed type expressions and also data type conversions. We can convert, I think we saw that earlier, to int float stream. Now here we say that data type resulting from a math operation depends on data types of the operands. So we should know that if we have two values, two int values, the result will give us an int. So what we mean is that if I divide an int value by int value, the answer will be int. Or if I multiply int value by int value, the answer will be int. And also, two float values, the result will be in float. So if I divide or multiply, et cetera. Now, if I have one int value and one float value, then int will temporarily convert to float. This will be done automatically by Python. So that's what we mean by mixed type expression. Let's say I'm multiplying or dividing an int value with a float value, the answer will be float automatically. So this is what we call the implicitly conversion. Python will convert the int to float because it knows we have another float. So the type conversion of float to int causes truncation of the fractional patterns. So again, if you have int and float, int temporarily convert to a float, result of the operation is a float. Now, sometimes we may have a long expression as we can see example here. Python gives us an option that if we write a long expression and it cannot go on one line, we can use the backslash then continue in the next line. So this, what this means is that we, are, we have a variable one times two plus variable two times three plus variable three times four plus variable four times. It's everything one, but we are using this backwards and slash, backslash, again, just to tell Python that this expression is one line. So here we say a long statement cannot be viewed on screen without scrolling and cannot be printed without cutting off. So a multi-line continuation character, which again is the backward slash, allows to break a statement into multiple lines. Then here also we can see the example given. Uh, here we are saying that any part of a statement that is enclosed in the parentheses can also be broken without the line continuation character. Here is in the you can see every statement here is in the parentheses, open and close. So we don't need to put the, again, the backward or the multiple line. So we can see the difference now. The first example here, we can see this is a formula. It's not in a parentheses, it's not. So we have to use the multi-line continuation character or the backward backslash. But if it's in the parentheses as this, 
or even the total, we put it in the parentheses, which is, this is what we always do. If I have a very long expression, let's say a mathematical expression, I rather put everything in the open and close parentheses so we don't need to put the backslash to signal Python to continue this statement in another line. So this example given, this program that demonstrate using again string concatenation. String concatenation means joining two strings together. So for example, we tell the user to enter his first name, enter his last name, we put those two first and last name in the two variable name, first name and last name. Now we want to combine the two names together. So we combine the names with space between them. So you can see we have the first name, we use the a string combination, we use the addition sign. So that's what I gave example earlier. If I have 20 plus five, I, I have a input from a user and I use the input function, user enter 20 and they enter 30. But we didn't convert the two values. So the two values will be what? String. Now, if I write 20 plus 30, my answer will be 20, 30. Because it joined the 20 and 30 together. The answer will not be 50. The answer will be 50 if I can convert both of them to again uh, uh, int or float. So that's what happened here. Since we know the last and first name, they are string, fine. Then if we use the plus here, we are going to get the output of the name. And here we intentionally open uh, quotation, space, and close quotation. What this means is that we have empty string, so it's going to print a space for us. So that if we are printing the, a full name, and that's what we are doing here, your full name is, we say plus full name. This is also because your full name is, is a string. Full name also is a string here. So we can join the two strings together using the plus. So second here, we have a variable name amount due. We assign 5,000. Then we have a amount due divided by 12.0. And this means we are trying to get the result in float. We assign the result to monthly payment. Then the monthly payment is, we can also put the monthly payment in the carry brace it will work. And also you can see we start with F. This will signalize that again, what we are printing is a, a decimal value. The, so the smallest call in the present for the answer for monthly payment in the variable. So more about data output. Again, in Python, we use the print function to display a line of output. We can also display what we call the new line character at the end of the printed data. So we have a special argument name n equal to a delimiter, the delimiter here can be anything. Most of the time, we want, we want to have a space. So I can have a delimiter, a space, or separate, etc. And we will we'll discuss more about that. So for example, a special argument n equal to a del delimiter here in a single code will cause the print to place a delimiter at the end of the data instead of a new character because the print normally ends with a new character by default. So print function uses a space as an item separator. So this is a special argument SCP separator equal to again delimiter. So this will cause a print to use delimiter as an item separator. Also, we have a special characters appearing in the string literary. Uh, for example, Backslash N means new line. Backslash T means a tab on a, our keyboard tab. If by default the tab is five space, if you have backslash T twice, then you're going to have a five and five space again, which is 10 spaces. So when plus operator used on two strings in perform string combination, this is useful for breaking up a long string literal. We can also format our numbers. So we have a special function given to us in Python called the format. So can format 
display of numbers on screen using built-in format function. So here to take two arguments, the numeric value to be formatted and also the format specifier, the type of format. So this return string containing formatted number. Also the format specifier typically include a precision and the data type. Precision means the decimal places. So for example, if the format is a decimal, I can have a precision of two, two F, which means two space, two decimal spaces. We will see again examples in our lab work. So a percent symbol also can be used in format string of a format function. We know a percent in arithmetic operations for remainder, but we can also use it in a format function to format the string. And this will function to format number as a percentage. So we know actually this is percentage, but we use it in arithmetic operation as a remainder also. Now to format an integer using a format function, and the data type is integer, we have to use D as the type is the data. Uh, since this is a, a whole number integer, we don't need to specify precision. Precision is for, again, decimal values, how many decimal places you want. Also can still use formal function to set fit width or common separators. We can. Then the last section we should know what is a name constant. Now, when we declare variable age, we saw that we can reassign a new value to it. Age is 20, next time we can make it 30. Now, if we like, and uh, this is a very good example here, I have a lot of uh, employees or they can be customers in a bank that have a bank account and all of them are earning the same interest rate or let's say a commission for employees sales, they are all in it. So now I can declare, declare variable as a constant. And now the difference here is that when you declare variable as a constant, you have to initialize it. So this means interest rate 0 0.069. Now I can use the variable interest rate for all the customers in the bank if their interest is the same amount. Now the advantage here is that if the interest rate changes, I will come to the variable here and change it. I don't need to change, let's say we have 100 customers. I don't need to go to the uh, calculations and change all the 100. And so that's one of the major advantage of using the constant value. If you know that you have a, a variable, a constant value that you will use it in many places or for many employees, workers, declare that variable as constant so that in case you need to change it, you don't have to change all the employees. You do it only once. So like, for example, here, the amount is balance times interest rate. Technical interest rate is 0 0.069. If I have 100 amounts, interest rate is the same. If all of the interest rate change, then I'll come here and change it once. So this is the advantage of using a name constant. Again, the name constant is a variable that is uh, initialize a value as a constant value. So the way we declare value assignment is the same as a constant variable also. So a name constant make code self-explanatory or self-documenting. Also second, name constant make code easier to maintain. And as we said earlier, change the value assigned to the constant and the new value takes effect everywhere the constant is used. And also name constant help prevent typographical errors that are common when using magic numbers. So for example, we have interest rate. Uh, all the customers are supposed to have 0.6, but all of a sudden we made a mistake. I had 0.2 or 0.5 for another customer by mistake, error typing. So if we know the value is constant, then it's better we use it. Declare the variable constant and use it, uh, the variable content throughout. So this will be our conclusion of lecture unit two dash one. And we shall move to unit two dash two, which we will talk about uh, Python uh, going graphical user interface and using the total package for beginning. So again, wish everybody the best. If you have any question, again, feel free to send an email.
or when we meet on live chat, we discuss it. Thank you.